Hello, everybody. Eddie Webb. We are here at Mesa Community College in the New Media Lab podcast series. And once again, our guest, President Lori Burkwam, has made time to come talk to us. And we have uh, several kinds of areas we want to talk about. <laughs> uh, we're trying to get a, a better audience in the New Media Lab. We had spent some years and we built up, uh, we had over like almost 450 subscribers at one time. And then some, I don't know, internal regulation stuff happened. And we had to start over about eight months ago and we're slowly building back an audience. But we are starting to distribute our podcast district-wide, and I've been getting lots of really awesome feedback. So I want to thank the faculty and staff across Maricopa Community Colleges for giving us so much encouragement to keep doing these podcasts and how valuable they are. And so I have an internal link, and then I have an external link. And so between those two you know, we seem to be reaching some folks and it's good. And I also want to acknowledge the one guy who always writes me as something critical. Keep up the good work, pal. <laughs> we need you in there, uh, you know, sounding off. Whether you're irritated or happy, at least you care. So I appreciate that. How you doing, President Burkwam? I'm doing great, Eddie. And I am one of your followers on Spotify. All right. So hats off to you for having an impact. And thank you for sharing our messages. And I've appreciated a number of, well, I've appreciated all of your podcasts, but there's a couple that have been significant in my memory. Um, our governing board member, Linda Thor, that session was, was very uh, informative, outstanding session. And then I really appreciated Jen Strickland's oh, yeah. session as well. Um, podcast, sorry, it's not session, but so I, all of them, I learned something, and I appreciate your commitment to communication, to sharing what's happening here at MCC, and how we continue to build community, especially in this time of working remotely. Well, thank you again. As always, we in the New Media Lab, we talk about teamwork, teamwork, teamwork. And of course, we wouldn't have a podcast if you all didn't make time for us. And uh, behind the scenes, we have Keegan and Paul and all the folks that make us able to turn on the lights. And so we appreciate everybody. It's nice to have you here. One of the things we wanted to talk about, when you first came on board, before you got voluntold to be our president, <laughs> you started a campaign of, of kindness on campus. And, you know, haven't been here a minute. It sometimes, Mesa can be rough, you know, at the other 10 cam or other nine campuses, not I think they're a little more chill than we are. I think we have a, a lot of uh, energy over here, a lot of ambition, a lot of super talented people that want to do stuff and a lot of moving parts, you know, and sometimes we can forget about just, you know, being kind to each other, I think. And my question is, why did you start that program of kindness? What mode is that something that you've done as a practice as a professional or is it so a need you saw here when you got here? I love that question, Eddie, because I think it's it was actually the a confluence of a couple of things. That particular point in time when I had started, I had in my first semester working with President Haney, I'd done quite a bit of outreach and meeting with some of our local community members, high school district from the Mesa Public Schools. And I was really shocked to learn that in that one semester, that fall semester, when I first started in fall of 2019, which seemed so long ago, really, um, there were eight suicides in the Mesa Public Schools. Wow. Eight. This year, there have already been five suicides in the Mesa Public Schools. So that was one piece of data. And then I think, and you, you reflected on this in your opening comments, but MCC is a big place. We have three different locations and then a, a pretty sizable online presence with what's happening in Z Learning. And, um, and so we're really, what I would see as we're kind of different families and how do we bring them together and make it more about collaboration, partnership, cooperation, Instead of competition, you know, I had heard for a, quite a while, well, you know, 
there wants to, there's an effort to get rid of uh, Red Mountain. Um, you know, why do we why do we have the downtown center? The, those types of questions. And I, I just thought, you know, the idea of the We Care and working with um, our uh, ceramics department to create these little things. My hope is that if you're meeting with, I mean, my general hope was if you're meeting with another colleague or you see another colleague who's struggling or you see a student who's struggling, you may not know always what to say. Right. But what you could extend is this act of kindness of, hey, we care at MCC. I care about you, Eddie. I care about our staff and faculty and our students here at MCC. And it was interesting. I had gotten a, an email it was about two months ago. It was in March. Maybe it was only a month ago. I guess it's only a month back. And um, this was a, a graduate of MCC who went on to Midwestern University and, and now actually works there. But this individual's name is Stephen. He actually emailed me and talked about how powerful his experience was at MCC hmm. because of the support, the guidance, and the kindness that was extended to him. And if we can do that for every student, if we can do that to each other, not knowing everything about each other and what we carry with us, to me, that's making the world a better place. That's mm. making MCC a better place. That's making Mesa, Arizona a better place. And that's what drives me. That's where I have passion. It's easy to be prickly or it's easy to be crabby. And you know what? I'm prickly and crabby at times. It's not like I'm above that. But how do we choose kindness more often? How do we extend ourselves and listen, seek to understand, and to be fully present and make ourselves available to be fully present instead of having four other things running, maybe looking at our phone, checking our email? Where are we fully present with each other? Yeah. This is a, a paradigm shift in, in culture that has a lot of depth to it, a lot layers to it a lot of mm -hmm. different variables and forces that makes democracy messy and very exciting at the same time you know i think some of the energy comes from deficit psychology mm -hmm. and i think a lot of the deficit it comes from lack of funding so we're sort of like this institution that has this amazing potential in the middle of a city, Phoenix, that's gone from a small little farming community to one of the largest metropolitan thriving industrial cities in the world. And we've not kept up with that in terms of our funding model because of our political views around taxes. It's like trying to grow a plant with no water. And so people still have the energy to build and do, but they need resources. And we live in a capitalistic society where you should be rewarded. You should be compensated fairly and reasonably. And I think people in Phoenix across Maricopa would agree with that. What they don't like is waste, of course. And so... You know, bridging those two things, I think it kind of created this sense of uh, deficit, well, I call it deficit psychology, mm -hmm. because in my own building, when, when just teaching wasn't good enough for me anymore, that I really had a vision of what education should be. And, and I went back and earned a doctorate degree, which cost a lot of money and a lot of time. So I invested in it, you know. It wasn't like on a, just a whim. I wanted to take this serious. And you have these ambitions, but if you don't have the resources to move things forward, you know, I, I noticed in my own thing, it's, and then you would get a little and get a little and build a little and get a little and then worry about it being taken away, take, right? And it's a really negative experience. And so I got into abundance of thinking of abundance and that mm -hmm. became a you've talked about you want to create a healing circle here at Mesa Community College around indigenous first nation people first and then I'm assuming that healing circle should be for everybody mm -hmm. because everybody needs to heal not only just from what we're going through but even what what we're talking about here these deeper sort of uh, layers of healing you know 
And that's what I wanted. And so I started learning about abundance thinking instead of deficit thinking. And it, man, what a difference it has made for me. I, I, I can let go of things easier. It's not meant to be. It's not meant to be because there's enough for whatever we're trying to do somehow, some way, you know, and I have to believe what well, part of your kindness program was trust. You talked a lot about trust. How does that fit in now that you've kind of been the, at the helm for a minute and you're managing resources and you have high powered personalities that want to get stuff? How does all that work? Trust and kindness in a business model. Is it still worth holding ground and, and, and making that the cultural paradigm? First, I love the abundance model. Um, I've done some reading on that actually recently, and, and it, it's really equatable also to the deficit model as opposed to the growth model for our students, right? Do we look at our students as coming here with not enough, or do we look at our students as coming here and welcoming them where they are and recognizing the growth pattern for them may bob and weave, it may peak and valley, but the bottom line is when they leave here, they're better than they started. Right. And when I think about the abundance model or the abundance theory, we do have enough for now. And it is what we have now and how we use it that really matters. And I think the connection for those two things with trust and kindness, the concept of trust, I think it, it's important in higher education, especially as an administrator in terms of building trust, because if, if there is this competition model for the funding or the resources, why would you trust an administrator? Because it's like, oh, if I become, if I'm their favorite, will I get something? Um, it, you know, or if I am in good with, you know, the president or the vice president or the executive vice president or whomever, maybe I'll get more resources. And that and see, that's what then builds competition. It's also what then fuels mistrust. Mm. And I, I think we have to be about, you know, when the water rises, all boats also rise. And how do I think about, you know, as we are creating departmental plans, as we're looking at our resources, and I want to talk a little bit about the Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds, because we have access and we will be having, you know, some serious college conversations. And um, I have uh, appointed Chris Bliss as um, a point person for this and leading this and helping out myself and uh, Brad Kendricks in really taking a look at how we make the Thunderbird experience for all students one that is amazing. And what should that experience contain? I certainly want it to contain some sentiment of how we are better world citizens. And that involves kindness. It involves healing. We've been through a lot this past year plus, a whole lot, on many levels, personal levels, professional levels. And now we have to make sense of that. And I think that's therein lies some healing to the healing circle you referenced. And I'd love to create something here at MCC that has roots in our Native or Indigenous population and an acknowledgement of the 22 different tribal nations that are recognized here in Arizona and a place for us as a community where we can come together and heal. Whether it was from the death of George Floyd, whether it was from the death of a student, or a budget reduction or some other major event that impacts us. Mm -hmm. I think providing that healing component is something that we need as a nation, we need as a state, and we certainly need as a college. Yeah. I, I just came back from our ceremonies that have been going on all week. You know, That's where I find my connection mm -hmm. and healing, not here so much. But I think the idea of creating that space, but more importantly, creating that culture you know, is what's most important, you know, that we're willing to look at healing first and not continue some sort of uh, whatever it is we need to be healed from would be the, my question, right? It's just creating that space, 
changes the entire culture and puts it in a direction, I think, that is going to be very healthy in the long run. We're, like you say, the student that wrote you the letter that feels that, makes that connection. I think that's critical, you know, to the well-being of our community. So, yeah, anything we can do to, to help. I'm really interested in, in uh, yeah, if there's grants, uh, Chris Bliss... We'll have her on a podcast. Yeah, I'm giving her a shout out right now. So if you're listening to this, Chris Bliss, <laughs> uh, you better put on your podcast shoes and come on down. I've watched your career from running the, the Child Center, then the Student Life, and then the, a campus, and now a funding project that's been pretty uh, uh, remarkable to watch your uh, progression. And we appreciate you. And so we're going we're gonna to have you on, share that wisdom with us. You know what, yeah. Eddie? Even just that you did that, what you just said out loud about a colleague, what if we did more of that? What if we gave shout outs to some of the amazing work that's being done? We do. We do faculty profiles. Did you see our, uh, you see this? Didn't I contribute? Yeah. Yeah. Here's a piece we're doing feature writer now. Mm-hmm. Or so we're featuring. So when you participated, I was having six to seven writers at a time. And now I'm doing one at a time because I get to spend more time with that person. I get to really engage in their story. And I want more people uh, to go on here and show them support. Mm-hmm. You know, because like you say, wow, wouldn't it be nice if we do that? Well, we do do that. But we only have one, two, three, four, five responses. Like, how do you get people to appreciate each other? You know, that's a great. I, I, I don't know. I think how to, this may be par. How about par? Putting that in par. Like, hey, appreciate somebody. But I think you're onto something. Yeah. How do we do it more regularly? Not yeah. waiting for an end of the year celebration. Right. Not waiting for. How, how do we do it more regularly? I received a um. The district has something, and I'm going to screw up the name of it, but it is something like job well done kind of thing, and you get a little email and a little dealio, and it was really it was really sweet, yeah. unexpected that I would receive one of them, and I, I received it from Chanel Carter in HR, and I, I was, oh my gosh, we got to get this out. We got to put this out more often so people yeah. see this as a possibility, and maybe people are using it, and I just don't know it. Um, but you're right. How do we honor the good work? How do we recognize all that's been happening at the college? Because we're big. We're a big place and we're remote. You know, and there, we have to just look at all the variables again, you know. People are like, I don't have time to, you know, I've got a lot of work to do. That's deficit thinking. Yeah, that could be. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> How do you think about abundance? Yeah, think about you have time just to take, you know. And and maybe that is where it starts. I mean, like I'm actually now that I've said that out loud, I'm really thinking that maybe should be a part of par. Yeah, maybe. You know, there's a, a a point in there. You know, appreciating appreciating people or something. You know, instead of just what have you done? What have you done? What have you you know? Prove what you've done. Prove it again. You know, over and over. And people are faculty. You know, I mean, you have to compete against hundreds of people for your job, and then you're on par for six years, and you know, the pressure's on and you know, there's a, I don't know, maybe, maybe that'd be a, who's out there that wants to come on and talk about <laughs> par? We, want, we need a par. Is there, isn't there a par person? Uh, somebody actually runs par. Facilitates that. Facilitates it. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, well, there's, I, I know that uh, I have a luncheon this afternoon with a new faculty. It's a new faculty luncheon after their first year. And Janice. Janice, that's right. Works with that. And yeah, so. Da- das, is it Das? Yeah. yeah. All right. Chris Bliss, Janice Dawson, Vitter. Y'all, here is, I hope you guys hear this podcast. We're going to be sending you an invitation soon, and we'd love to hear about your expertise and your experience in these areas. I think it'd make a really, really great uh, conversation. And a shout out to Cesar. Cesar. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Um, My man. Who, you know, worked with you on the writing. And, this is this is the good stuff, yeah. right? I mean, this is the good stuff. And how do we focus more on the good stuff? I started my work at NAU a year before him, but then I got this grant 
And so I couldn't start in the summer. I had to wait. So I was taking half of my classes with my cohort and then half of the classes with the class behind me, which he was in. And uh, I really enjoyed him, man. I mean, you know, he's a family man. He, uh, he's a hard worker. He's smart. He's a scholar. He's he thoughtful. is a scholar. And he's, he's hip, you know. I mean. Um, Unlike us, we're. Yeah. Old people. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're old people. But he, you know, him and Jaime really, uh, those two guys really uh, shape my thinking around. I don't want to say prejudice because that's the wrong word, but maybe ignorance or conditioning or something like that because they were both uh, such different guys, but so important to their communities, right? So me, my family, growing up with mixed blood, you know, Indian people and poor white people, we, we lived in those farm labor camps, pick cotton and potatoes. And I work with my grandpa and uncles and stuff in the orchards, not the field. I didn't work in the fields, but I went out and helped pick peaches and stuff like that and help put them in the crates and all of that growing up and then I family worked at the cannery. And so when I was thinking about Mexicano people, I was always thinking about farm labor. And as a undergraduate, I actually got to spend time with Cesar Chavez, you know, mm. shortly before he had passed away. So I had always had in my heart this, you know, we're like grapes of wrath. You ever remember grapes of <laughs> wrath people? So you know, in my heart, I always feel a deep connection to the fields and the people who work in the fields. Though, to me, I, you know, those are my people, right? And so Cesar, he was of that same mindset. And then Jaime one day says to us, I've never worked in the field. Mm. You know, I don't know anything about being in the fields. You know, I grew up in, in uh, El Paso and in Juarez and, you know, I'm Mexican, but you know, I, I never were, and it really, uh, I guess as the, you know, people are now the hip word is, you know, woke, uh, you know, it really woke me up to this stereotype and my own thinking that I had about what it meant to be him Mexicano. So, uh, Cesar did presentations and really did amazing work, you know, up there, very thoughtful, uh, really made an impact, you know. Hey, brother, we're going to have you on, too. Today, today's uh, topic is who's coming on next? <laughs> who's coming on the podcast? You know what, next? though, Eddie? How amazing that you opened yourself up to those two amazing men yeah. and learned. And that's what I believe we need to do more of with regard to DEI work. Yeah. How's DEI going? Are you, you well, heard from them? You know, I sent out the uh, email yes, or two days ago. Um, about the trial and the outcome of the trial with Derek Chauvin. And, oh. um, you know, I've received, I sent something both to staff and faculty and to students, and I've probably received, uh, I don't know, 15 or 20 emails from mostly students, actually, interestingly enough. Um, some who were happy and some who said F off or, you know, other choice words. So we're clearly uh -huh. continuing as a community and as a college trying to make sense of what's happening in the world around us. And it's not like we're going to meet and we're going to get to an end point and say, ah, we have achieved, you know, whatever we have achieved. It's a lifelong journey. Yeah. Not a day to celebrate for me. Yeah. I don't think there's any cause for celebration there. I think what we are supposed to be teaching as scholars is that spectrum of the lowest form of intelligence we're taught at home is violent. Right? So the higher intelligence is kindness and compassion, right? That's the higher mind. And the lower mind is violence. And all we saw was everybody having to dig in around and I'm glad now that I don't have to apologize. Uh, when I had the chief of police on, I felt remember Keegan. I had, I I actually apologized because I called it a murder. 
And at that time, he's like, well, we have due justice, you know what I mean? Uh, Due process. process. Uh, There has to be a a trial. And I was like, you're right. You're right. I misspoke and I apologize. At this point, he's been charged with murder, but it's not been murder. Now, I, you know, it is a murder. All three accounts, right? Mm -hmm. There's no way out for this guy. But the difference is, finally... The brotherhood amongst law enforcement finally gave way. They did not close ranks around him and protect him at any cost. The only reason this man was found guilty on all three charges is because his fellow officers testified against him. To me, that's the most significant part of the trial, right? And once that happens, you're going to see a real shift because before everybody would close ranks and, you know, I mean, you could clearly see, uh, 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 in fact, this goes into our next uh, topic we were going to talk about is the power of video. Mm. And so, you know, we have nine minutes of video of uh, this man being murdered and you have other videos where we can see it for ourselves. And then we get into our system of justice of how it can lend itself to lawyering that doesn't really have anything to do with truth or justice, right? It's more about who can be crafty. Manipulation. Yeah, yeah. Technicality or this or that. And again, it's a system that's trying to be fair. But, you know, Lady Justice, uh, you know, the skills... You know, I I don't know. But in this, in this particular case, it worked. It worked, I think, the way it was designed to work. It was open, it was transparent, and that came to the uh, proper conclusion, you know. And the power of that video. And the power of the video. That video did not lie. That's right. That video demonstrated to us a man asking to breathe. I can't breathe. How many times did he say that? I watched it one time. That's all I wanted. I, I, it broke my heart. I actually brought a anger and a tear to my eye when he started calling for his mom. Mm-hmm. Six, six man, hands cuffed behind his back, laying on the ground, got three guys on top of him and one guy murdering him for nine minutes and calling for his mama, man. I tell you, that broke me up. Yeah. really angered me, you know, like this is mo- this is a lynching. I'm watching a lynching, you know. Yep, modern day lynching. Yeah, and I can say that now under the law, you know. So you've had people push back a little bit. I don't want to spend a lot of time with that, but so you had some pushback. That, yeah. Yep. Yeah, amazing. Power of video here in this, in this instance, um, I think it created the evidence that could not be denied, but equally important. The Brotherhood, uh, George Floyd. Um, today, we just want to take a minute and uh, recognize you and your family, your suffering, which will now become a legacy. The George Floyd Act, I think, will mm-hmm. make a big, big difference. And so, we just want to acknowledge everybody in the community here. Um, that this has been a significant time in our history. And I just want to acknowledge that. It's because I know we're going to move on to another topic and I don't want to seem too quick about that. So just, uh, yeah, everybody. A uh, pause. Yeah, just a, a moment here. Eddie Webb, we're here at the New Media Lab our second part of this podcast, we're going to talk about how Mesa Community College, now I've been here and I've been here long enough to like, when I got here, I was surprised that in the bond and in the, in the actual structure of the campus, there was so little in student services. And now we have a huge complex over there. I think we've spent a number of years really beefing up, uh, investing in student services 
And I think we've spent a, a good deal of our equity in making shoring, shoring up uh, student services and getting up to speed Now I want to talk about reinvesting in the academic side of our college because now I think the pendulum should, it's time to sort of swing back a little towards. What happened to abundance thinking? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I say. Let's get that abundance (laughs) train back over to uh, academics. And, uh, you know, we have any new fresh plans for uh, our academic programs? I know we have the, we're investing in the new media lab and I hope that continues obviously. Uh, but anything exciting out there that we're not aware of that's happening in the academics? Well, I know that I've been working with our, um, academic colleagues and, uh, Nora Reyes and others. I think we have our moving, I had a request for about 28 OYOs. Um, oh. And so some of them could be connected to COVID and needing some additional physical space to offer more sections face-to-face. So with the limitation of how much space we can have, and I think we're all hopeful for it being three feet as opposed to six feet, but um, that's one aspect. I think we're all also anxiously awaiting the vote on the bill regarding make, having community colleges offer a four-year degree. Oh, yay. Um, and I think that, you know, when I look at our community and the needs of our community, we have, and I'm excited about the Mesa Promise because we have opportunities to contribute to that transfer pipeline. Yeah. And to continue people moving on that transfer pipeline who maybe never thought they were able to do that. Yeah. I have a... That's that's real exciting. It is exciting. Yeah, and yeah. I have a nephew who, you know, he is on the spectrum. He's going to attend a community college. And I wish he were attending MCC because we offer such amazing support services. Yeah. But also we offer a great, a wealth of opportunities to consider that four-year transfer degree. So I think we are, it, it certainly is moving forward we're moving on it. Guided Pathways has helped us to help, to define those alleyways or pathways or streets for our students to be able to access those four-year degrees. But the question that I think is more important is what do we need to do that? Where where are the gaps or where where are we falling short in in that in, in those investments? Well, I think, uh, you know, we start down that road, they will reveal themselves and uh, completely confident that as we move towards this notion of four-year degree of how that's going to really bring the kind of developmental and general ed up, I'd really like to see us go, you know, to be a little more forward thinking in terms of where the student is going, right? So that that is very, very exciting. I know I have... A, a meeting coming up downtown on uh, Cinco de Mayo to talk a little bit about what we're talking about is this articulation of the new media arts with universities and transfer and how to, how to build that out. So uh, very, very excited about that. And with the new ASU Sydney Port Jerry, um facility in downtown Mesa, there's some good partnerships we should think about yep. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that's going to be a game changer. I'm telling you, it's it's these guys. I It is going to be a game changer. I think we also have to acknowledge, Eddie, that where we are coming out of this pandemic, that we have to also acknowledge what our learners or our students are needing because many of them at this point can't afford to go 100% full-time right. at a community college to transfer to a four-year degree. We have to be thinking in nimble ways how do we build certificates upon certificates? Yeah. So, you know, advanced manufacturing, how do we put people in a Boeing where they can make a living wage and continue to take classes right. to e- increase their educational attainment level and complete a, a degree, a certificate? That's what we need to do. Those stackable credentials are going to be so critical in the workforce But I think also, how can we think about that with regard to our transfer process? Um, When you look at the data 
Eddie, and I know you love data. Look at the number of our students who withdraw after 10 weeks. Yes. It's, it's mind-blowing. So how do we adjust our teaching and create an eight-week teaching section so that we are conveying to students that you can do this in eight weeks? Right. And even more nimble when you think about Rio, what Rio Salado offers in four-week classes. And you make that 16-week class become four four four-week classes, and you see student success in more incremental ways, and students experience that success quicker or sooner. They don't have to wait for 16 weeks to finish a semester. I mean, that the 16-week is still the farming schedule. Yeah. Yeah. And so since we're not going home and planting crops and harvesting crops and and all that stuff, we can we can learn at a quicker a, a pace. You know, we have models in California. The UC system is a ten week uh, system. There's again the variables are mastery, right? Like mastery learning, I think is important. We don't want to just push people through programs that come out the other end have not really you know mastered the the content. I think there's that to think about. I think there's burnout uh, on the faculty like how to spread that out and how to make that work but the at the end of the day it's something we, we're just going to have to do we just we just have to start figuring out how to do those kinds of things and get it up and operational yeah that, that stuff really excites me it should be it is new infusion of energy and the bottom line is it's what would best serve our students right and help them be successful, help them get a leg up in life, whatever that means. What does leg up mean anyway? I don't know. I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I see it a lot, but I don't, I'm not, I don't know. But at this point, it's like trying to turn around the Titanic, you know, because we have our accreditation. And I just think you have to have, you got to build a team around all of that. Because I'm actually, when there was uh issues we had around accreditation a number of years ago. I was surprised when I got to talk directly to the accreditation folk as opposed to some committee, Mm. how they were a lot more progressive. You know, they were like, if you want to do eight week courses or 10 weeks, it's fine by us. You know, I mean, we think it's show your student outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, really? Like, they, they were really open to innovation and stuff. More than I was being, like, the, you know, because it seemed like, you know, this coming from the messaging. Like, oh, no, 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 we can't, do, you know. But they, that, that particular group, anyway, seemed uh, very innovative and forward-thinking, yeah. And how do we incentivize innovation? So you talk you about go, faculty yeah. burnout or the, the impact. I hear you. And how do we incentivize it so that's not the experience or the feeling that our faculty are like, oh, enough already. I don't want to do any more of that. Or I'm exhausted. I can't. Start over. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how do we think about that intentionally and build something that addresses just that issue? Well, that is the thing, the difference between a university and a community college, right? So at the community college, teachers, we're not here to research. And I've always, if we do the four-year degree thing, I mean, those were my initial questions to Dr. Thor off camera too, was I would like to see us operate a little more like that because one, we could bring in a lot more funding, right? Faculty could but they're going to need to do research and they're going to need to publish and, and, and all of that sort of, so it sort of changes the culture of teaching at a community college because the community college teacher are real teachers in the trenches with their students, you know, full schedule every day in the classroom, out of the classroom, in the classroom, you know, like really pouring themselves into it. You couldn't do that at an eight week pace. I mean, you could for a little while, but uh, sooner or later, there needs to be some reprieve, you know. So we just, but we have, there's models out there, you know, we can figure it out. We can, and maybe we also need to think about, um, you know, we have adjunct faculty and we have residential or, you know, par faculty. Yeah. 
And that's a big gap yeah. between those two. You're either this or you're that. Yeah. Um, what could be a possibility in the middle? You know, could we have a, you know, a lecturer title where a lecturer is on a contract? So there's more yeah. consistency and, and you can count on them. Whereas adjuncts, I think, are a, you know, are you available for this class? Are you available for that class? Yeah. And is there, is there an opportunity for us to create another, to increase our bandwidth by creating another category? I'm not sure that's the right term, right. but is there something there we would consider? Yeah, and again, that's a whole other RFP shake-up. Faculty agreement. Yeah. Which a- you should also have Liz Sakar on to talk a little bit about the faculty agreement. And yeah. what changes are in store for faculty in the coming year with the new agreement starting July 1st? This is a podcast about who you yeah. should be talking to next. All right. So uh, <laughs> I know you guys are on our Spotify. So we have Chris Bliss, Janice, Janice Dawson, Dawson, and Liz Sakar coming on. All right. That's our lineup. So you guys get ready because you're going to get an email here in about two hours from me. We'll see. I'd like to get it in before all of those before the end of the semester would be really nice. So let me ask you, because, you know, I've been watching these. Uh, I was actually asked to be a moderator, I guess, on some of the interviews. And then my, my guy was one of the final candidates. So I, I withdrew. I, didn't, mm-hmm. I just, I didn't want any kind of weirdness happen around that sort of stuff. But then I watched him. I thought, oh, it really wasn't a big deal. You just can kind of introduce him and that's it. Because I would really enjoy doing stuff, stuff like that. Um, but in listening to those things, I also realized when we talk about DEI and we talk about uh, all of this started around challenging privilege and uh, the culture of privilege and that we needed this sense of more diversity and appreciation for that. What, what really struck me was the candidates were not, I don't want to say the word I have up, the, up there, but it seemed like the fact when 10, 15 years ago, <clears throat> when the administration asked me to help them build the American, take the American Indian Center to an American Indian Institute. And there was already a white paper that existed. Uh, Ted Hibbler had written and Bo uh, uh, Colbert had been working on. And so they asked me to put a team together and we did that. And so then I was a part of the committee to not get the internal structure together, but also find a location, right? And then I did all of that. And then we did the summer stuff. And then we did this stuff. I, 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 I saw that that really kind of pigeonholes a person into one particular thing. And the candidates were talking about, well, you know, I was on this committee and this committee and this committee. And, you know, they were free to kind of roam around a little more. And it, I never thought about that before until I watched these interviews that DEI people can also get really isolated mm-hmm. in an area, you know, of expertise that actually becomes limiting in terms of leadership. And I never, that never one time crossed my mind until I watched these interviews that there is a level of diversity that is not built around ethnic culture or native nations or, you know what I mean? Have you ever thought about that? When people sign up and all of a sudden they're just in this one dimension? Actually, I had conversations about my colleagues at Wisconsin, when I was at Wisconsin, on this very issue. Wow. And that it has an inordinate amount of impact, meaning that it's like you, we used to say the highest um, suicide rates were with dentists and with EMTs or paramedics. And it was because of, you know, they did things that either caused pain or they saw so much death and dying. Um, and the same thing for our veterans, you know, that they have witnessed so much 
I think DEI work is similar. I think that it takes a toll on a human and it takes a toll, especially when it is on a black or brown body. And the, the things they are subject to in trying to work on efforts of diversity, equity, inclusion, and I want to continue to push us on belonging. Um, but that work is, is hugely impact, Im- has a huge impact on the people who are doing that work. Right. Pigeonholing, I think that, that was more so historically. I think it's getting less and less because the leadership skills are transferable. The delegation skills, the organizational skills, the content areas are definitely transferable. I think it used to be much more of a pigeonholing. Yeah. I think there is still isolation. Yeah. I think, there, I think that's a huge issue to think about, um, isolation and, and what that means to that individual. And we need to have people in those environments supporting that particular leader, that particular um, officer. So that's important. Yeah. Yeah, I was just, you know, I was thinking you're, you're sitting in an interview and, and you say, well, what, you know, tell us about your work. Well, you know, I worked for 10 years doing DEI work, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion work. And then the next guy comes in, a person comes in and says, what'd you do? Well, you know, I worked on the accreditation committee. I worked on the composition committee. I work, you know? And so I worry about that a little bit. So I think, too, it would be how you articulate your involvement, your lead, what you did in that. Mm-hmm. So DEI folks, if you're listening to this podcast, it's just something to think about. You know, as you move forward in your career, make sure that you're expanding your work as well, which is ironic because generally we reward people for being expertise in one area, right? But if we're talking about leadership, I don't know the answer to this because I literally just thought of it this week and never, you know, and the fact that you're saying you've had this conversation before with other colleagues, you know, is very encouraging to me because... I honestly, it never, it never crossed my mind before because I was always so committed to this one work that I didn't realize how that could be, end up being a deficit later in someone's career. So just think about it. And, uh, sounds like an invitation to have uh, somebody else on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) We'll have to get Nicole. We've already got Nicole over here. We'll have to find, uh, we'll have to, uh, who's, who's running the Hispanic, uh, grant? Um, Megan the, Garvey, right? Well, there's a team that's for the Sendus grant. Okay. Um, but there's a search process right now taking place for the director of the grant okay. of the Sendus program. So we we'll stay tuned. But okay. that would be a great person to have on. Yeah. But the, I think it's important here, Eddie, and I will be, I have to say this, is that no one person should be going it alone. Yeah, that's true. They can't. Yeah. Um, so although we have a CDO, and we have a process taking place right now for internal candidates. And I'm committed to next fall beginning to roll out the process for a full-time CDO. It can't just be that one person. Yeah. A lot of administration hiring going on. Yeah. Lots of interims. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to, you know, go through them one by one yeah. to have to offer a level of permanency to the college. Yeah. Well, that's what we've all been you know, I've been talking about the, how the interim thing, the, the problem with the interim thing is you build a relationship with someone, you do this work, and then they leave. Then you got to start over. You know, it's just tiring. Anyway, we're here at the New Media Lab at Mesa Community College having a conversation with our president, Dr. Laurie Burkwam. Just covered a lot of, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of areas. We just decided to kind of have a, a conversation today, not a real heavy agenda. Just moved through some areas. I hope you guys find it entertaining and informative. I think, uh, you know, again, uh, it's all about teamwork. And I think that Mesa Community College, to me, is one of the greatest, uh, you know, colleges in the country, you know, just because of my colleagues, uh, faculty, uh, staff, 
you know, the whole range. Students. Stu- oh, yeah, students. Yeah, I don't get to see students much these days. I up on my computer screen. I can't wait to have you guys back and get rocking and rolling again. And that'll be sooner than we think. Fall, right? Okay, what will fall look like? Well, I hope that we are moving toward much more face-to-face in-person services. Um, I think we're working to having more face-to-face classes um, offered at our college spaces, so at Red Mountain, Downtown Center, and here at Southern and Dobson. Um, I want the vibrancy. I want that energy. I want the Thunderbird student experience to be one that is engaging face-to-face, hands-on, doing things like here in the New Media Lab or conducting labs, lab experiments in, the, in chemistry or working actually in art. So th- that's my hope for the fall semester. Um, of course, we could change if, there's, if we need yeah. to, but I've been vaccinated and I feel good. I was able to visit my parents, you know, those sorts of things. So fingers crossed we're going to get to fall semester and have much more of an on-campus presence. I can't, I mean, honestly, I'm excited. So, but I have a quote. Could I end on a quote? Let me, uh, yeah, you know, we always give our guests the last word here. (laughs) So let me invite you to your final statement. Well, you just, in your gratitude moment that you just had a, a few seconds ago when you were thanking the faculty and staff and It reminded me, I had the opportunity to be um, a part of a lecture with Naomi Tutu, and she's the daughter of the Honorable Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And she said this quote, and it has always struck me. It is, we are who we are through other people. We are who we are through other people. So I've learned from many of the names that you expressed here and many others that we haven't talked about right here at MCC. People have taught me to be a better leader, a better administrator, a better president, taught me to be a better human being. And you're one of those people, Dr. Webb. Well, what makes that work is that you're open to that. You know, I think that's the biggest refresher, is to have a president who uh, is willing to listen as much, you know, as lead and, and or make listening a part of listening and access. And I've actually seen you change your mind. And that's really refreshing to see somebody change their mind. Everybody, uh, Eddie Webb, we are here at the new media lab at Mesa Community College, uh, wrapping up our uh, spring semester with uh, our president, Dr. Lori Burkwam. As they say in my dad's language, you guys take care of each other out there. We're all we have. Talk to you soon. Hello.